Okay, good evening, Facebook. Good evening, everybody. This is Lady Victoria here with Victoria School of Etiquette Training and Consulting. Um, I'm doing a little bit of a different video on tonight, an area that I've really not branched off into um, on my Facebook page, but it is an area that really needs a lot of attention. Okay, um, I want to talk about senior care, and I want to talk about the care that our seniors receive, um, and a little bit about the kind of work that I do. Okay, um, everything is etiquette relatable. <laughs> this is true, but listen, tonight I um, titled this video, The Autopsy Tells the Story. And that is because that's one of the ways that we gain the truth about my subject matter on tonight. Um, and what I'm talking about is Alzheimer's and dementia in our seniors on today. In my regular job, my everyday job, I see this in the workplace practically every day. I see this in the workplace practically every day. My regular job that um, I've been doing, at least with this particular agency, for um, about a year and a half, but I've been doing caregiving for many, many, many years, um, over 20 years. And it started, of course, when um, I had my own home-based daycare for nearly 20 years. Um, I've also been a nanny. I have been a residential care supervisor, residential care aide. I've done home health. I've done CNA. So I've done caregiving in various forms. I've cared for children. I've cared for young people. I've cared for um, children and teenagers with various disabilities. I've cared for uh, disabled adults of varying degrees. And now my, I guess, area of specialty where I'm specializing is our, our senior population. And I've been caring for seniors now, oh Lord, since, well, I was about to say 2013, but really it's been a little bit longer than that because I did respite care work. And with respite care, I cared for um, teenagers, 17, 18, 19 years old, and young adults. But now specifically caring for seniors, I guess, in that area, I have been doing it for the past four years. Um, and I see a lot of things in my work environment every day and every week. Um, the population that I care for, the age population that I care for, specifically now they're in their 80s and their 90s. Um, for the past two years, the youngest client that I've had um, in the senior age group, the youngest client that I've had has been 88 years old. The oldest client that I've had has been 96 years old. My 96-year-old client um, wasn't really diagnosed with having dementia or Alzheimer's. He was very active. His mind was very sharp. At 96 years old, he could tell me where he went to school, what school he went to um, in grammar school. He could tell me every place that he's ever lived. Um, he was able to perform a, perform a lot of his ADLs, which are activities of daily living or IADLs, independent or interactive activities of daily living. He could do a lot of those things for himself. He could take care of his personal hygiene. He could comb his hair, brush his teeth. He sometimes needed assistance with getting dressed. He walked with a cane um, and he got around. He liked to go out for walks. So that was what he was able to do at his age and his stage of degeneration, but he was still very, very sharp. Some of the clients that I currently have are in their 80s, mid 80s and early 90s, and they can't do as much. Some of them are at various stages of dementia. Uh, one of my former clients had um, advanced dementia and she has lost um, a lot of her memory. She has lost the capability to do, take care of her lot of personal care, just things that we normally take for granted, things that perhaps our parents and our grandparents are still able to do, she is unable to do at her advanced stage. Um, and some of them, like I said, are at varying places. But going back to my subject matter, 
the autopsy tells the story. These clients, these seniors that I'm taking care of, do they have Alzheimer's or do they really have dementia? And we can only tell, medical science can only tell the real difference of what is the root cause of the disease that they might be suffering with, especially Alzheimer's during the autopsy. So after their demise, then you can get perhaps the real story. There's no real test available today that can let you know or let your, your family members know if you are going to have Alzheimer's or if you are going to have dementia. There's no real test. And I'm, I'm, I'm taking from some of the research that um, I've recently been doing because it is very interesting. It's very interesting uh, what I see in, in, in every day, in my everyday job. Okay, so um, I, I'm quoting from, um, from, from a book here. Uh, a definitive diagnosis of Alzheimer's is not yet possible until an autopsy is performed. Uh, but neural testing can be done that indicates the likelihood of whether Alzheimer's or a related dementia is the root cause of the problem. So when we're talking about our senior population, when we're talking about our loved ones, and we've been told that they have Alzheimer's or that they have dementia, um, get multiple tests done and go to more than one doctor. In the initial stages, you likely won't see um, a specialist, but you have to make a request to see a specialist or you have to make a request um, to see uh, someone in the field that is more experienced than just your regular um, doctor. So they need to give you a referral so that you can see a specialist in the industry so that you know for sure. Because there are other diseases like Parkinson's, like Huntington's disease, um, um, what's the other one, Kruzfeld, Jacob's disease, that can mimic the symptoms of dementia, but it's not really dementia, okay? Um, so we recommend, or I'm recommending, since I'm the one that's talking about this on tonight, and your specialized doctors would recommend the same thing, that um, you get tested by a specialist or have your loved one tested by a specialist. So let's go with some definitions here. And I'm really not going to get all into the, the medical portion of it. I, I'm not a doctor. <laughs> I'm just talking about what I see in the industry, what I see um, in, the, in the field every day since I've been doing this work. According to the National Institute on Aging, dementia is a brain disorder that affects communication and performance of daily activities. And Alzheimer's disease is a form of dementia that specifically affects parts of the brain that control thought, memory, and language. And oftentimes we hear people, even doctors, even specialists sometimes will interchangeably use both of the terms that it's Alzheimer's, it's dementia. And although they're very closely related, that actually each disease is actually very, very different. Um, dementia is an umbrella term for a set of symptoms, including impaired thinking and memory. It is a term that is often associated with the cognitive cognitive decline of aging. And oftentimes it's so easy for even medical personnel to just slap that label of uh, dementia on your loved ones without really, really, truly making an informed decision. And this reference goes on to say that other common causes of dementia like I mentioned before, are Huntington's disease, Parkinson's disease, and Kruzfeldt Jacob disease. They're all related, but they're all different, and they're different markers. Some of the markers for dementia are the same ones of Huntington, Parkinson's, and Kruzfeldt disease. I had a client when I lived in Texas um, that had Parkinson's disease, and for the whole year, that I cared for him, that was the diagnosis that his doctor had given him. 
But later on, before I left Texas and um, came back to the Chicago area, his doctor began to say, now he's developing Alzheimer's. So, so you see how he started with one thing and ended up with something else, with a secondary diagnosis or an additional diagnosis. Um, now, unfortunately, I, I, when I left, he was declining further, and um, I learned that he did later pass away um, that year. Um, so he passed away from complications because of um, his disease. But I wasn't there hands-on anymore um, to communicate with him and his wife and his family about what the real story was. But um, either one, whether it's Parkinson's or Huntington's or uh, Cruz felt Jacob, whether it's a form of dementia, whether it's Alzheimer's, whatever it is, this disease is very, very debilitating. And I see with the senior population that I care for on a daily basis, um, how they're impacted, how their lives are impacted and, and how their families' lives are impacted by this disease. And let me say to you, of course, this disease is not discriminatory. It does not only affect a certain population. It does not only affect a certain demographic. It, it does not only affect a certain gender. It affects everyone, white, black, Hispanic, um, uh, 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 Oriental, Asian, uh, men, women, younger, older. I've um, seen patients as young as their 50s that have been affected by dementia or Alzheimer's. And um, it's, it's no less um, hurting and it's no less impactful for the individual that is suffering from it um, and for the families that are affected by their loves, loved one's diagnosis. Um, it is just as uh, hurtful. It, it is just as uh, debilitating, whether you're in your 50s, whether you're in a, a high demographic area, a low demographic area, and by demographic, I mean, you know, age, race, income, <laughs> educational status, all of that. It really does not matter. Um, what, it does not matter. <laughs> It does not matter uh, what demographic you come from, it still affects all people the same. One of the things that I see with the population that I care for currently, uh, this population of seniors are wealthy. Um, so many of them are very wealthy. Um, they pay for the services that they receive or their families pay for the services that they receive out of pocket or they have hefty insurance that covers um, so much of their care and what their insurance does not cover, they pay for out of pocket. The population that I provide care for currently, they do not. The facilities in which they live the agencies that they are signed up with, the residential homes and what have you, they do not accept any individuals that have any type of public assistance, okay? They do not accept any individuals that have any type of public assistance. So if you're receiving Medicaid, right, uh, Medicare, you likely won't qualify to sign up with the agencies that I have worked with in the last year and a half, two years. They don't accept that clientele. These agencies, um, I guess you might say, provide care for an elite group of people. And it's not anything wrong with that. I'm not, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with those that might have any kind of public insurance. It's not, not anything wrong on either end. I'm just speaking to the population that I currently care for. And uh, this is their financial status, that they are well able to afford this. When you come into their homes, when I, when I come into their homes, when I come into their um, residential facilities, when I come into um, their rehab facilities, they're top notch. They are top of the line. 
One thing I discovered though, again, the illness is not discriminatory. The illness does not affect them any differently because they have money versus those that might have the same illness that don't have money. The money provides them a level of care that they are accustomed to that's relative to the lifestyle that they've lived before they became ill. It, it, it's, uh, I really don't want to go too, too deep into it because um, it, it can be very emotional. It can be a very emotional <laughs> job caring for them. Um, but I will say this about caregivers, and, and, and this is kind of the second, you know, this is the second layer to, to what I want to talk about tonight, that caregivers, this can be a hard job. Sometimes I, I enjoy my work. Uh, I enjoy what I do as a caregiver. As I said, I care for everything from babies now to seniors, disabled seniors, uh, uh, adults with various varying disabilities and what have you. So I enjoy caregiving. I like doing that. I get so many rewards from it. If you are in this industry for the money, get out now because you're not going to make a lot of money in the industry. You're not going to get rich. I mean, wait, unless you rate at the high. But as a caregiver, as a regular caregiver, you can make a decent wage, but you're not going to get rich in this field, in this industry. So if you're in it for the money, you're in it for the wrong reasons. Okay. If you're looking to make a pile of money, you're in it for the wrong reasons. It can be hard work. Okay, it can have uh, wear and tear. It does have wear and tear on your physical body. It does have wear and tear on your emotional being. It does have wear and tear on your heart simply because we become attached to the clientele that we care for, especially if you have a long term case, if you have a permanent case, we become attached to them. We get to know them. We get to know their various idiosyncrasies. We get to know perhaps if you study your clients and if you pay close attention and if you educate yourself a little bit on Alzheimer's and dementia and the other diseases and the effects of it and what it does to your patient. If you look at their back history, you find out, you read their care plan, you talk with your supervisor, you talk with your family, you get a sense of what their life was like before this disease took over. So you, you get to know them, right? They still deserve the best care. So if you're looking for a fat paycheck, mm -mm, wrong industry. If you're looking to be rewarded, monetarily or if you're looking to get a lot of pets on the back and a lot of great job today victoria you might not always get that you might not always get that while it might be hard work it should be heart work understand it might be hard work but it should be heart work right it should be like this. You should have a love for what you're doing. You should have a love and care sincerely about the population that you're caring for, whether it's seniors, whether it's middle-aged adults with varying disabilities, um, what have you, whether it's children. It's heartbreaking at every level. I've seen all of them. Even when I had my daycare, I sometimes had children with special needs and it's heartbreaking to see sometimes how they are affected by the disease or disorder, right, that is affecting them. Seniors with Alzheimer's and dementia, it's like being trapped in their own brain. They want to get the words out. They, they want to be able to express themselves, but they no longer can because their memory has been affected. Their cognition has been affected. No matter how old the client is or the patient is, an Alzheimer's or a dementia patient usually has the mentality and the capability of a three-year-old. A three-year-old. So imagine, imagine a full-grown adult in their 80s and 90s. They've lived a full life. They worked and they've amassed wealth, they've taken over businesses, whatever it was that they did in their former lives. And they often, they were able to retire. 
and dementia or Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or Huntington or Cruzfeld Jacob began to set in in their 60s or in their 70s. Some have been battling this disease for 30 years. They oftentimes don't die from the disease, but they may die from complications of the disease. It causes other things to happen in the body. It, 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 over a long term, it dismantles the brain and it breaks the functions down. So, I mean, just trying to be able to put a sentence together, that's barely the tip of the iceberg. There are so many other things that goes on in their mind and they become frustrated. Their families become frustrated. Their families become tired. Their families are in denial sometimes and they want to quit and they want to give up and they don't know what else to do. And they've gotten past the stage of denial. They've accepted it, but they don't know what else to do. They don't know what else to do. They rely on a staff of people. They rely on a community. They rely on family. Sometimes family is not their family members, but family is the ones that's taking care of their loved ones. The family is the one that's at the facility where they've had to put their loved one in because they can't care for them full time. And, and another thing, you know, another thing that I've learned in this business, oftentimes, sometimes caregivers, residential aides, CNAs, home health care aides, workers become critical of family members. They don't care about their loved ones. Look, they put them in a facility. They put them in a home. Well, maybe they put them in a home because they could no longer care for them full time. But when they put them in a home, somebody has to pay that bill. Somebody has to pay that bill. You don't know how much money they have. Do they have enough to last for the next 20 years while that loved one is in care? So don't be so critical of their families. We are not in their shoes. We're not in their shoes. We're filling shoes that they can't feel for a variety of reasons. Some of their family, their children, their grandchildren, their nieces, their nephews, whomever has the power of attorney over, the, over their care, they oftentimes don't live in state. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. And sometimes they might live in the same state, but they might live two hours away. So they rely on people like me. They rely on residential homes. They rely on assisted living facilities. They rely on rehab centers and homes when their loved one falls and breaks a hip or leg or arm. And they have to go into rehab and get well before they can come back home. They rely on us. They rely on them to provide quality care for their loved ones. If you don't have a heart for it, please don't do it. Please don't do it. People that don't have a heart for caring for people that really need care. I'm here to tell you that you're adding to the problem. You're not a part of the solution. And I don't say that critically. I just say that because it's what I've seen in over 20 years of being in the caretaking industry, caregiving industry. It's tough some days. Some days I've wanted to cry and go home because I've been so frustrated by what I see. Sometimes I've cried because I, as a caregiver, didn't understand what was the next thing to do. What was the next way to reach my client? How do I grab them back? How do I bring them back to a place of comfortability when they're so far out there, when they are sundowning, right? When they're hoarding and, and holding on to something that you don't know what memory that little thing is provoking in their head that has brought them to a place where the three-year-old, right? You have children, you've had the three-year-old. It's mine because I had it first. It's mine because I have it now. Our seniors go through that same thing. It could be a paper towel. 
It can be as simple as a paper towel, but something about that paper towel, something about forks, something about a dress, a blouse, a newspaper, something, something triggered something, something about that thing triggered something in their head. And it caused them to go back to a place that they they find it hard to come back from that place because now they're stuck there. They're stuck in that memory. They're stuck in that day, right? It's things like that that sometimes uh, make the job challenging. I... Um, have had experiences with clientele, like I said, sundowning. It starts to get dark outside. The client looks out the window and realizes it's dark outside. And from being there, standing in the moment, looking out the window, realizing that it's now dark, and turning back around to look at their surroundings that was familiar to them a few moments ago, now all of a sudden it's not familiar. They just know it's dark and I need to get home. But they're looking in their current environment. They're stuck in the now of the memory that's running in their head. And I'm eight years old. Mother's going to be worried and I need to get home. Oh my gosh, where am I? How do I get home? That can cause a rant to go on for hours because they don't know how to get home because they don't know where they are. They aren't in present day. They're in the place where they were at eight or 13 or 26 or wherever it is. And I just need to get home. We can't yell at them. You can't uh, uh, snap them out of it. You have to find a way that's conducive for your client in the moment to try and help bring them back. And you may not be able to. There have been times when I've not been able to, I've not been able to bring my client back to today, present day. They're stuck in the now of that memory. And all I can do is console them. All I can do is comfort them. All I can do is say to him or her, let me help you. Let me help you get home because that's that's all they want is to get home. So you go with the moment. You go with the moment of helping them achieve what it is they are trying to do. That person wants to get home. So I take the unfamiliar surrounding that they are in and say, yes, I'm going to help you get home. But I don't know how. I don't know how. My cousin knows, my sisters know me. They may call a person's name. They know how. And I say, okay, well, you know what? Let's go meet her and she'll be able to help you. Is the person there? No. But in the client's, in the patient's mind, is the person there? Yes. I can't see them. But in order to better care for my client, what do I do? You go with the moment. And so I've been sometimes able to bring them back to a place of awareness, something in the house, something in the apartment might trigger and get them back to present day. Oh my gosh, this is such um, a controversial subject. And I, you know what, better, better than controversial, let, her, let me say that it's very misunderstood. And I think that um, we as a people, as a population, as a whole, not just African-Americans, but um, we as a people should educate ourselves better if we possibly can, especially if you have a loved one that is going through um, this sickness, this illness that have been diagnosed with either Alzheimer's or dementia. Um, Wow. To have to wait until the autopsy tells the story seems like a terrible ending to it. But once you receive the diagnosis, I would say educate yourself. 
go to reliable resources um, to get your information, become studied, become your own um, expert or the expert for your loved one because everything that's in the textbook might not be textbook for your situation, might not be textbook for your loved one. So you have to study your loved one. You have to know the things that they did beforehand. You can go back a number of years and perhaps see the progression. You probably remember the signs that you saw that you didn't recognize as signs. Go back as far as you can. Sit and talk with your doctor or with your team of doctors. Um, make every information that they ask to available to them. It's, it's, and, and it's hard to do that when you find yourself faced with the situation because now there are forms of dementia that can be cured, but currently there is no cure for Alzheimer's. There are forms of dementia that can be cured, okay? If it's a medical dementia, some of those can be cured, but Alzheimer's, there's no cure for Alzheimer's. There's no cure for it. Um, when I had my patient that had Parkinson's, I did a lot of reading and research. And my understanding is there's no cure for Parkinson's as well. But educate yourself, educate yourself, educate yourself. Um, and, 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 and realize that your loved one is really the best teacher that you can have. Your loved one's story, okay, then kind of becomes your life. And in order to make their life more comfortable, there's so many adjustments that you're going to have to make as a family member, as a child, as a grandchild, as a niece, as a nephew, wherever you are in the family tree, okay? If you are a caregiver, hey, John, thank you. If you are a caregiver, you're going to have to make some changes in your life every day. Let me say it again. As a caregiver, if you have a loved one that has this diagnosis of dementia or Alzheimer's and find out what type of dementia it is because there are different treatments for the various types of dementia. Maybe I'll do a follow-up video on uh, the various types of dementia and um, Alzheimer's and the different treatments that are available. Like I said, I'm not a medical professional, but I am someone that has been in this industry. And because I work with this population, I try to educate myself. So you do the same. If you're that person, you're gonna have to make some changes in your lifestyle and in how you handle them. And I see caregivers all the time that they, they're in this industry, but they sometimes aren't, mm -mm, I wouldn't want them to be caring for my loved one. I would not want them to be caring for my loved one. Um, and and I've cared for, uh, I don't have numbers, but I've, I've cared for um, at least two patients that um, had dementia and or Parkinson's that passed away from it. Okay, so the length of time that I care for them, I care for them un until their death. So um, it's very interesting. Um, it can be very challenging. And if you think it's challenging for you as a caregiver, think about how your loved one feels when they feel trapped in their own brain and they know what it is that they want to say to a degree, but they no longer have the language or the cognition to be able to do that. And as I said earlier, most of them have uh, the mentality of a three-year-old. So a three-year-old only has enough language that a three-year-old can use, right? Whether that three-year-old has 100 words or 300 words, it's going to depend upon the care that he got from about the age of three months up until the age that he's three years old. So he can formulate a sentence based on what he has. Think about a 70, 80, or 90-year-old full-grown adult, right, that no longer has a capability. They have thousands and thousands of thousands of words, but they can't put a sentence together because their brain is no longer connected enough to say, I want an apple. I'm crying because I'm in pain because my hip hurts today. They no longer have the ability to do that. And so we as caregivers, we find through studying their behaviors, 
right? Through caring for them every day, there are certain questions that we can ask. There are certain things that we might notice. Like I said, some of their idiosyncrasies and their behaviors, their emotions, just like a baby, when they're crying, when they're upset, you're able to recognize this is a, this is a cry of pain. You know, this is a cry of discomfort. This cry is because of another need. We should be able to make those not just assumptions. It may be assumptions in the beginning until you begin to know them. But we should be able to make those kinds of caregiver diagnoses. That's what I call them. And so communicate with the family, communicate with the caregivers. Sometimes they're very challenging, very, very challenging. When I had my daycare business, I often said sometimes to some of my parents, oh, Lord, well, worse than the children. So understand that families can be difficult, but if you build a relationship with the family and you let them know, listen, I'm here as a, a, a help to you as well as your loved one. And I'm here to advocate on your loved one's behalf. I'm a partner with you in caring for them. And so uh, when you can do that, families appreciate that. They really do appreciate that. And oftentimes it'll bring that barometer down. They're anxious. Oh my God, you're the fifth caregiver that we've had in three months. Of course they're concerned. Are you going to stay? You're the fifth one we've had in three months. Are you going to stay? And are you going to be a good fit for my loved one? So I could talk about this um, for a really long time, but um, I just felt compelled to talk about it on, on this evening because I see so much. I see caregivers that are uh, kind of force feeding um, their clients. I, I, I see caregivers that sometimes don't treat their clients like people. You know, they're people, they still have emotions, they still have feelings, and, and, and sometimes they have moments of cognition and, and you know, they're snapped back into present day reality. And, and then in a few minutes, it might be gone. It might last for two hours. It might last for two minutes. But whether they are full throttle and um, whether they are full throttle advanced dementia or full throttle Alzheimer's, whether they're at point A, B, C, or Z, it is your responsibility as a caregiver to give them the best possible care because they deserve it. They deserve it. Show them love, make them comfortable. And you know, I have to say this, right? The tenets of etiquette are applicable to this community of people every day. Kindness, consideration, respect. Kindness, consideration and respect. They are deserving of it every day. Don't think so much about perhaps what you give to them. If you can turn it around and think about what you get from them. Because one of the things that I begin to notice and assess for myself is I get so much from my clientele. I get so, I learn so much from them, even in the throes of their condition. So treat them like people, treat them like you would your loved one, treat them like you would your parent, your grandparent, your aunt, your great aunt, your niece, your nephew, whomever it is. So, oh my gosh, this has gone on for such a long time, um, but I'm sure that I probably will do a follow-up um, video talking about the various forms of dementia talk a little bit more about how dementia and Alzheimer's are related and um, those other disease that can diseases that can mimic dementia but it's not really dementia it could be one of the other three that I mentioned Parkinson's um, Huntington's disease or Kruzfeldt Jacobs disease so this is Lady Victoria with Victoria School of Etiquette Training and Consulting and if you have a loved one that has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's or dementia, or if you have a loved one that might be exhibiting signs of what you think might be Alzheimer's or dementia, I urge you to get your loved one checked out. 
I urge you to take them to their medical doctor. And then I urge you, I urge you, I urge you to follow up, ask for a referral with a specialist in the field so that they will be properly tested, get those neural testings done um, that may show some of the markers um, for the probability of the diseases mentioned, okay? Um, our seniors are living longer these days, and because they're living longer, we are becoming and have become their caregivers, and we want to treat them with dignity. We want to treat them with integrity and respect, always. They deserve it. They deserve it. Whether you have the autopsy report or not, you want to know what's going on with your loved one. And the only way you want to find out is to have them tested, is to have them tested, okay? So uh, I'm gonna try to sign off now. <laughs> this is Lady Victoria with Victoria School of Etiquette Training and Consulting. And please like and share, pass the video on. So until the next time, be in your best etiquette health and I'll see you the next time. Bye for now.